Joe Biden heads to Delaware after his son is found guilty in a federal court. How will it affect this American political dynasty? And Farage ducks for cover. Do we take threats to politicians seriously enough? Hello and welcome to Newsnight Live. Each weeknight, a heady mix of illuminating interviews and eye-popping insight. Tonight, we are dealing in big political danger, literally and metaphorically, on both sides of the Atlantic. We'll talk Biden in a moment with a fascinating guest. But first, here, Nigel Farage took some incoming on top of an open-top bus from an object or objects as yet unidentified and tweeted that our democracy is under threat. We're on the sofa tonight. Marvin Rees, the former Labour Mail of Bristol, no stranger to threats. The writer, broadcaster and podcaster, Rachel Johnson and Sean Bailey, the Tory peer and former mayoral candidate for London. And, of course, our in-house political head, Honcho, Nick Watt. First of all, Rachel, you are the sister... Uh, of politicians, you are the daughter of a politician, and yet people feel that you are to blame. They can abuse you. What's that like? Um, I get it to such a small extent compared to the two guys on either side of me, and probably even Nick gets mm. gets it in the neck too. Anyone who is vaguely recognisable is subject to, you know, some kind of. I mean, I was attacked in Sainsbury's. That was what really surprised me. I was thinking, in Sainsbury's, you know, it wasn't even little. And also, I had, a, <laughs> I had a, um, a glass of red wine thrown over me once at Wimbledon. And I thought, I thought in the home of lawn tennis, you know, but you sort of adjust and but, but, uh, but, but, but do you But because of that, are there times when you do actually feel vulnerable, when you are actually on your guard? You do, you do. And I don't want to be too specific about it because, you know, sometimes if you have a show on the radio, yeah. you know, people know where you are at yeah. certain times and that can feel, make you feel slightly vulnerable, I admit. And, and I suppose yeah. the rest of the family are, are, are maybe more inured to it than you are because actually they take that political flack all the time. But do they yeah. talk to you about it that actually well, they're concerned? Well, when my father gets shouted at, you know, abuse he says I think you mean my son you know yeah. because they look very alike in, in lots of ways right they, they kind of interchange well you're a family that do actually look quite similar <laughs> but you, you are definitely Rachel Johnson thank you um, Kirsty thank um, you for that um, Marvin there was a documentary about you um, and the controversy over uh, the Colston statue in Bristol but there was a troubling moment uh, for you and your wife Kirsten but before we talk about it let's have a look at the clip the police have warned Marvin and his wife Kirsten that there are direct threats being made to their family. They've had anti-terrorist intelligence, like those three words together. It's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> they say it, it's low level, but we want you aware. With the kids, they saw the first threat because it was blatantly written out, Marvin must die on our sidewalk. Our neighbor said if he'd seen it first, he would have put a T on the end. So it would have said Marvin was diet. But Marvin, you're you know, clearly making light of it, but actually for the family. And, you know, your wife, Kirsten, I watched more of that documentary. You know, she was visibly moved. It had, had, had an impact on her. And you've got kids as well. Yeah, and uh, we were talking before we come on again. I mean, family's not in play. Yeah. I step into public life, uh, my children... Uh, and, and my wife didn't. And in fact, actually, it was one of the things that Tom Watson uh, warned me about in 2012 when I was the first candidate. And someone asked for a photo of myself and my children and Kirsten because they thought it would be good. But he said, you've got to make a decision now uh, because if they're in the photo, they will be considered, uh, you know, in play. But I, think, I, do, I do think, sadly, it has become part of the way politics is done. To be honest, that's not just about journalists and activism. It, 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 sorry, it's not just about politics and activism. It's also the way the f journalistic framing of politics is often about uh, the, the conflict and the row uh, and the argument more than it is, uh, you know, about nuance and trade-offs and, and the subtleties of actually running, you know, a place and the trade-offs uh, we have to make. And that makes it very difficult to have 
meaningful discussions about but, the big decisions we have to make. But I, I, I'm interested in this idea that um, that very thing possibly makes people think twice, actually, going forward There's about no whether doubt. they want to enter public well, life and put themselves really on the front line. So I was, no was in, I was overseas a few years ago. It was actually Stanley McChrystal at the time. In 2010, this was. Uh, and, and he said that one of his big fears is that the price people now pay for getting involved in public life was becoming so high, you're only going to have two types of people do it, narcissists or people who pay any price to get power. Mm -hmm. So there is a danger that if we would just treat politics through <coughs> the framework of anger and almost hatred sometimes, we will end up with the politics you, you, that you, you, well, I mean, deserve. You, Sean, you've both been a candidate, but you're also out with Tory candidates at the moment. And I wonder if you feel hostility, if you, if you get incoming... There is yourself. absolutely no doubt that there's good people who would be in politics and seen what's happened and won't. And it starts online. You have people who are supposedly famous, who, who have big followings, who organise pilings and generate anger. And then that becomes something that happens in the physical world. Mm -hmm. When Susan um, Hall ran for mayor, she made it quite clear to me she was sometimes afraid because she said, I'm a, I'm a vulnerable woman travelling around London. Somebody might come to me. What am I going to do? I had men turn up at my house and the police had to get involved. Yeah. We have made politics now about personal attacks so people attack now of course you know we have no idea what was thrown at Nigel Farage whether it actually was dangerous or not but the fact of it is something that's unsettling it is I mean, look, I'm gonna say something very carefully here mm -hmm. uh, it's not acceptable right protest is a legitimate part of our political journey Right? Mm. The progress we've made to, in this country and around the world has often been ushered in by people making protests, but the protest needs to be intelligent, informed and properly targeted. Uh, and, and it needs to think about the way it lands in, in the public domain. So, so protest is important. What happened around Nigel is not an acceptable, not an intelligent form of protest. What I can't pretend though, is that he hasn't fed into a culture of anger and hatred and othering that ends up manifest in a, in a, in a very, in this kind of aggressive type of politics. Well, uh, well, Nick, there's more developments on the Nigel Farage story tonight. Yes, so a 28-year-old man uh, has been arrested in Barnsley after allegedly throwing items uh, at the open-top bus that Nigel Farage was campaigning on. Uh, Nigel Farage has talked about how there was wet concrete in a cup thrown at him uh, and talking about how also stones were chucked at the bus. And last week, obviously, there was that milkshake thrown at him. And tonight he spoke at a rally and he talked about how the democratic process is under threat. He talked about how there was also mob violence today. He said that there were some young students there talking about how their minds have been polluted at university and he is saying I will not surrender to the mob. Across the political spectrum, James Cleverly, Home Secretary, said no place for violence and intimidation. Thank the police for their action. Almost identical statement from Yvette Cooper, who hopes to be the Home Secretary, and talking about how she was appalled by the physical attack on Nigel Farage. I mean, picking up on what Marvin and Sean are saying, I mean, I spoke to MPs in the former Parliament. Uh, I've actually been shown one death threat that one of those then MPs received. That was pretty chilling. Then MPs were talking about how, yes, the parliamentary security authorities are quite good but sometimes they're worried it's not good enough and one was saying to me they needed to think about whether they need to pay for their own security and also threats to family but members just, so but when we talk about the culture and the framework created by some national leaders Farage is one of those people that have shaped it I, I you know Bristol was a city or is a city of 42 square miles People from all different backgrounds live there. The number of times I've looked at the way national politicians have framed national debates and international debates in a way that does not help our ability to create a space in which people live together. This, th this stuff does cut feedback in a feedback loop. So what I'm not doing is justifying what happened, yeah. but yeah, we're well, saying you have to take like some responsibility. You were licensing violent protests, which, no, which constitute criminal assault. And for, for me, who worries every single day about members of my family being attacked yeah. because they were in politics, I'm really sad to hear you talk no, like that. That's, that's a total misunderstanding. The real, what I'm the doing real is, problem, is, is, is a total misunderstanding. To that and that's, that's why I said I want to say this very carefully. Yeah. What, what I'm not doing is licensing no. uh, uh, what happened at all. What I'm saying is if we want to understand what went on, we have to look at all the things yeah, that led up to it, including the creative... Yeah, but that's rather than about yeah. the actual And act that's what intelligent politics does. Itself. It looks at context. Um, look, look the, the, the real problem is this. You've had people who've legitimised attacks and we're now into the, the natural progression of that. And if, and if you go back to when CCHQ was attacked by students, you had lots of politicians saying, well, it's not that big a deal, good luck to them. Well, this is the natural progression of that. And if you really want to see where this is going on, wrong, go online. The level of death threats rape threats and organised pilings is just 
well, coming into the real world. Well, well, at this moment, let's now be joined from Edinburgh by Lord Walney, who's the author of a report for the Tory government on political violence and disruption, which was published just last month. Uh, Lord Walney, thank you very much uh, for joining us. You know, you've been hearing from our guests, you've heard what they had to say. Tell me, um, you are recommending, and indeed, I believe that what's happened is that there are protective measures. Can you explain what's been happening uh, when people have been out on the campaign trail, for example? Yes, there has had to be a considerable uplift in the investment in protecting, first of all, members of parliament through uh, their, their time in, in recent months, given the, the, the rise in the threat level facing MPs, primarily triggered by the, um, the unrest over Britain's position over, um, over the Gaza conflict. And that has now been translated into the election campaign, where all candidates now have the, um, the access to these protective measures from the police, which has, w was in place also in 2019, but it, it is clearly uh, really needed now. There are um, um, there been those unfortunate incidents that you've been talking about with Nigel, with, concerning Nigel Farage. There were also a number of, of MPs and candidates across the country that are facing very real threats. And um, this is absolutely the kind of thing that is going to potentially put many good people off from coming in to serve their communities unless we can, all of us, I think, look at one, what are the, the physical protective measures that need to be put in place, but also what is the culture that we need to foster that can actually celebrate and uphold our parliamentary democracy rather than seeing it being demeaned in the way in the ways that too often it has been in, in recent months and so, years. So in a sense what you've got is you've got kind of legitimate protest and protest that's actually uh, potentially injurious to people's health and well-being. Are there candidates, for example, or do you know, are there candidates, some candidates under close protection? There certainly have been um, reports that there have been MPs who have been placed uh, in the extraordinary situation of having the, the, the close protection security officers, which uh, for all the time that we have been in politics have only really been uh, available to very senior ministers in security related roles, sure. the Defence Secretary, the Home Secretary. There are um, candidates and MPs who are not able to travel on public transport. Mm. Uh, West Streeting, um, Labour's Shadow Health Secretary said recently that he was one uh, among those. Uh, a friend of mine who's a candidate who I won't name uh, had a uh, uh, someone arrested mm. for a death threat that is unfortunately becoming a relatively but commonplace can, thing but, now. Can, can, I, can I just put to you something, uh, you know, because obviously we were hearing from uh, Marvin Rees a minute ago, and I just want to ask you, I mean, when, mm. when Nigel Farage, in the heat of the moment or whatever, or, says that democracy is under threat, I mean, do you think this is hyperbole, or essentially do you recognise that actually what he's talking about is proportionate? Well, I, I wish we were not placing Nigel Farage in the position yep. that he is giving, incredible giving that message. But actually, he is right. He's not the first person to say it. The government has rightly convened a defending uh, democracy task force, which Labour uh, has been uh, constructively engaged mm -hmm. in. This does erode our democratic freedoms. If you are in a situation where um, MPs and candidates are genuinely fearing for their physical mm. safety, which many are. And then you have the situation that we had in the House of Commons a few months ago, where the Speaker um, changed the proceedings because of the, the fear of uh, intimidation and physical threats to MPs. That is a clear impact and erosion so, of, our, of our democracy. And we need to understand better, I think, where the absolute sacrosanct right to protest mm. is too often being abused and becoming the kind of physical threat of intimidation and that implied threat of force and menace, which is not legitimate and is affecting how people live their lives and can affect how people vote. And, and we've got to understand that that 
is not Thank acceptable. You. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Well, this afternoon, Hunter Biden was found guilty in a Delaware court on three charges in his gun trial. His father, the president, has vowed not to pardon his son. But now there could be electoral jeopardy for both presidential candidates because of convictions. Mick Mulvaney, the former White House chief of staff under Donald Trump, can talk to us now from Florida. Uh, and Mick, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, first of all, the first thing to say, of course, is that this is a personal tragedy for a family being played out in front of millions of people. That, in a sense, is tough enough without the political dimension. It is, and I think a lot of a lot of Americans are sympathetic to what the Biden family is going through. At the same time, other folks are wondering why this case did not plead to some sort of lesser offense so that it did not have to be trotted out in public. The jury didn't spend a lot of time finding Hunter Biden guilty. Um, so there's a lot of questions to be asked. But you're right. This is a this is a tragic sort of outcome, the result of a terrible addiction. And all too many American families have personal sort of experiences with that in their own families. And they're certainly uh, empathizing with the Biden family tonight. In, in which case, if there was any sense of making political capital out of it, what do you think the calculation that Donald Trump is making now about the verdict? He has been, it, since the verdict, actually pretty reticent. Uh, yeah, as have many Republicans, for the reasons I've just mentioned. Keep in mind, Donald Trump is one of those people who has uh, addiction in the past of his family. His, his his brother died of complications related to his alcoholism. So it, it strikes Donald Trump's family just as much as it does um, many others. You've seen Republicans be extraordinarily quiet on this topic in the last 12 hours since the decision was handed down. Honestly, Kirsty, I think if anybody's going to try and make political hay out of this, it is probably Joe Biden, and it's probably understandable. You can expect him at some point, possibly in our first debate, to say something along the lines of, no one is above the law. Look at me. I could have pardoned my son, but I didn't. And that's going to be a very powerful message to people. Again, I don't think either party is going to spend a lot of time on this. But if you see either side sort of at least referring to what happened today, it's probably more likely to be Democrats than it is Republicans. Of course, there could be a riposte in that presidential debate, because one thing that Donald Trump has has said, of course, is that if he is president, he will be the one to pardon Hunter Biden. Um, sure, that's that's a very Trump thing to do. Keep in mind, uh, this is the first of two criminal actions against Hunter yeah. Biden. The bigger one, and certainly the most sub more substantive one, is the one on tax evasion that we expect to go to trial sometime in September. This is the one. It, it moves away from the addiction and into mm -hmm. things like where Hunter was getting his money, whether or not there was influence peddling, those sorts of things. So I think both sides are sort of looking more towards September for the political impact of that trial than they were today. But it doesn't surprise me that Donald Trump said he would pardon he pardoned would pardon Hunter Biden he probably would so looking ahead then because there's more jeopardy in terms of political capital to be made out of a, a future uh, income tax trial as it were though of course Donald Trump's facing his own financial uh, issues which could be uh, highlighted what we've got now is we haven't even got the start of the presidential campaign but actually there's been quite a lot of high drama there is. Well, keep in mind, we've pretty much known that these are the two candidates for a long time now, but certainly this will be historically the longest race um, in the history of, of our country. Neither of these gentlemen have actually been formally nominated yet. And our debates start, I believe, in 16 days. So it's uh, two weeks from this Thursday, uh, and they'll actually be debating, having formal debates before they are formally the candidates. So yeah, it just goes to, to, to show you, Kirsty, that uh, the, the politics here is almost nonstop, almost 24 hours a day, three 165 days a year forever, um, but it also goes to how already familiar with these candidates the voters are. There's very little, I think, that folks can learn out of a conviction of Donald Trump, little that they can learn out of a conviction of Hunter Biden, for sure, and maybe even little that they can learn at the debates. We'll still be watching it. It'll still be a sort of must-see television, but I'm not sure it's going to move the needle very much politically. The country is still very divided, and we expect to see that in the results of the November election. Mick Mulvaney, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you.
Well, what the Tory manifesto was not was a marmalade dropper. It had been spread liberally over the nation's toast for days. Everything from the further cut in national insurance to rebooting, literally, national service after 64 years. But was there anything to surprise? Nick, you were there. And I mean, the very surprise anyway was that it was at Silverstone. Absolutely. And you enter that, you go into this very oh, smart right. hotel, which is right by the finishing line. You cross this bridge over the track and then you're in uh, the conference centre, which is right by the trackside. And after the speech by the Prime Minister, we were having a briefing about how you're going to pay for this. And there was that £12 billion in wealth. Markets. A car goes by. <laughs> and then there's another £6 billion in tax evasion cuts. <laughs> another Not an car goes car. <laughs> and it was a racing car and it was Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt uh, was filming there. I mean, there. did they not know that there was a movie being shot? A movie being shot there. Brad Pitt not in the pit, <laughs> absolutely on the race course, but obviously we couldn't see him because he was moving quite fast. Um, but, but before that, we did have the speech by the Prime Minister in what looked like a pretty obvious conf a drab conference hall, but it was at the racing track. And he talked, as you say, about how if they win the election, the Conservatives would introduce that third cut in employee national insurance, another 2p cut, that would allow them to say that they have halved it. What we weren't expecting, what we did get is a complete abolition of national insurance for self-employed people up to profits of £50,000. Now, for some in the Conservative Party, that's not enough. Why didn't you touch inheritance tax? Why didn't you pull out of the European Court of Human Rights? But at the event, it was loyalists, it was cabinet ministers and I caught up with a few of them. Well, Theresa May's choice to be a future leader of the Conservative Party, how would 17 billion of tax cuts do that? Surely the sort of compassionate Conservative you're about is it is much more than a bunch of tax cuts. Well, Nick, I admire your ingenious uh, question, but there is absolutely no vacancy. I think you saw today just how ambitious uh, Rishi is for the future of our country, but also that he has backed up that ambition with fully funded plans as to how we achieve this. And I think whether you look at uh, the tax cuts that he has set out for every stage of our life, from uh, uh, tax cuts for uh, uh, families with young children through to people of working age, through to the self-employed, through to people trying to buy their own home for the first time, through to that really important protection for pensioners, a protection incidentally that Labour will not give them. I think you see here a really bold plan for how we see the future of our country in terms of tax cuts. James Cleverley. Nicholas. Are you talking about your border policy, not specific on the number of flights that will go to Rwanda, no specific commitment to pull out of the um, European Convention on Human Rights. Aren't you pulling your punches? We've committed that if we get a Conservative government under Rishi Sunak, there will be a regular drumbeat of flights and those flights will only stop as and when the boats stop. That's what we're committing to, that's what we're explicit about and in all those areas there is a vacuum where Labour Party policy should be. Keir Starmer is saying actually the new Jeremy Corbyn is Rishi Sunak. He's describing this as a Jeremy Corbyn style manifesto, loads of stuff put in the wheelbarrow, no credible way for how it's paid for. So what do you say about this idea that Rishi Sunak is the new Jeremy Corbyn? I think that's a new level of desperation by a Labour Party that has nothing positive to say about its own agenda. All we've heard from Labour politicians so far are criticisms, sometimes sadly personal, of uh, the Conservative Party, Conservative Party politicians. What is distinctive about what Labour is doing on education? What is distinctive about what Labour is doing on housing? Nothing. Michael Gove there, and of course that was Vicky Atkinson at the beginning, who is the Health Secretary. I, I definitely spotted R Brad Pitt in the background. Definitely. Yeah, I did. But listen, let's just talk about this manifesto, Rachel. Um, was it a ripping read? Um, I haven't read it all. There's, there's absolutely no human beings photographed in it. Usually these things are spattered with photographs of uh, the leader, mm. the supreme leader. Uh, Rishi Sunak is completely... Brother in the 2019 one. Um, there are absolutely n nothing. There's no image of, of um, the prime minister at all. It's interesting that um, there are tax cuts, 12 billion, I think you said, Nick, and also an increase Actually, in Actually, 17 billion. 17. It's 12 billion cut of, plus, uh, paid for from welfare, but, six yeah. and cutting down tax. But the costings of it, where the money is coming from, it's all down by the back of the sofa. It's like getting rid of the quangocracy and making things more efficient. And it's all those old things that people get trotted out, like when talk about the NHS, mm -hmm. we'll cut the managers. And, but then it struck me that the Labour Party has also committed to no tax rises. So it's in exactly the same position. Where is the money coming from? But, but, but tonally, 
Do you think this was the right way to have a snap election? Do you think they were all ready for it? No. I think that if you're going to be, try and be a lucky general and call a snap election, you at least need to have your troops manning the passes mm. and you need to have a plan and you need to have a day after and all those things. And I think Rishi was just I, I, I think in so love be, with the idea. Getting your vote then. He was in love with the idea of spiking reforms guns. And in, in what it actually did was flush out Nigel Farage yeah. to lead reform against the Tories. So you won't be voting for the I'm not. <laughs> come on. I'm not. I haven't decided. You haven't decided. I'm an undecided, a floating voter. Well, 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 well it, can we just turn to the, the electoral possibilities and the way that actually lots of people have been parachuted into constituencies, Labour and Tory, I've heard on, on both sides. Um, you're the two times mayor of Bristol. Um, what happened to you when you were thought you would actually like to be a candidate? Well, basically, I didn't get selected. I mean, it <laughs> is extraordinary. <laughs> two times <laughs> mayor. <laughs> Two times mayor, a star well, in a the Labour Party. Well, I wouldn't call myself a star. I mean, it's, you know, there's a there's a process. I mean, I'm not going to pretend I wasn't disappointed. I it wouldn't it, 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 no, that wasn't true if I was uh, uh, to say that. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm here now, you know, as a pundit on your mm -hmm. sofa instead of uh, running for Parliament. But did you have a conversation with Keir Starmer about it? I mean, he must have known you wanted to stand. You must have seen the credentials that you have by, by the fact that you've been running Bristol, as it were. Well, I didn't have a direct conversation about it, no. Uh, but look, I mean, you know, we need, uh, there's a process by whereby the party uh, select its candidates and make, uh, you know, make their decisions at lo uh, local level and at national level. And, um, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm sat here, so self-evidently I'm, I'm not... Is there, them, an issue? I, Is there an issue about candidate selection? I mean, you can talk about, you know, Diane Abbott, you can talk about whoever, Pfizer Shaheen. Is there an issue with candidate selection? Well, it's been a discussion, but I mean, there's a fantastic team now out running uh, for selection. I've been working very hard for an amazing candidate in Bristol, Claire Hazelgrove and mm -hmm. Kerry McCarthy. We've got some excellent people coming forward. But look, uh, yeah, I'm not going to not going to pretend I'm, you know, I haven't, don't have a degree of disappointment. Of course I do. I put myself forward. Mm -hmm. But listen, it's not the first time I haven't been selected by someone, it won't be the last. I'm not going to get all bent out of shape about it. Well, uh, Sean <laughs> Bailey, tell me about uh, what you feel about this whole campaign. I think the campaign is, has had some, some notable highs and some lows. I think, I think there's things they could have done better. Like what? Uh, the, uh, well, the, for, t for instance, today, I would probably wouldn't have launched at Silverstone with all the noise. It's little things like that that I mm. think make people think, oh, what's going on here? But I think the clear thing is there is some direction here. He's talked about repairing the economy. He's trying to deliver tax cuts, which people will want on the back of our cost of living crisis, which is very real for most people. So I think this is headed in the right direction. But when you talk about a manifesto, the mm. real thing is, is it credible? And will it stand up to Labour's manifesto? And here's the thing. I think Labour's manifesto will say all the right things but what will be really important is what it doesn't say like for instance the last time round, they never talked mm. about the fact that they were to get rid of the bank of england yeah. and i think people are really interested in politics say, okay you've said the nice stuff but what is it you're keeping from us and the real big debate here is who is more credible so can but, i say something yeah. about what's not said then mm. on that on that front yeah. uh, first let's leave the math i'll leave the math to the manifestos contending the parties contending i did a word i did a search on language in here for local government you would, you would think from this manifesto that we were not in a situation where one in five council leaders and chief execs were not talking about going bankrupt within the next mm -hmm. two years. What we are facing at the moment with the demise of local government is a collapse of the way the nation... Hold on, just a second. Let me say something. the way the nation's run. I've been a local... Let, let, well, let me say something. Can I just let finish my line? Yeah. I, I won't talk over, you talk. Yeah. Well, let Go me on. say, I, I obviously sit in regional government. I sit in London yeah. Assembly. Yeah. Many local governments are actually run quite badly, and that's why some are in this position. If you'd ask me, I actually would give more money to local government, but let's bear in mind, this is a national election. Yeah. But but do you think... No, Sean, like, just, just Sean, do you think the Conservatives are heading for defeat? I mean... Look, if the polls are to be believed and they got it wrong about Brexit and, and other things, yes, we are. And I'd be a but lunatic... Can you remember such and, a on, difficult on, time for the Conservatives? No, no, I'd be a lunatic if I sat here and said that we are not behind. Cle clearly mm. we are. After 14, 15 years of government, you always fight an uphill battle. But the idea that it's a foregone conclusion, I don't agree with. And we have yet to scrutinise the I, Labour Party. Can I come back to a point yeah. that I just started there? I, I just don't think it always registers just how serious this crisis in local mm. government is. Mm. Local government is not just a collection of disconnected mm. services. It's a convener of place. It, what, one of the things that I've pointed out directly to Michael Gove, actually, at the LGA conference a couple of years ago is 
the, the financial hit to local government hasn't just meant the underfunding of frontline services, it's meant the loss so, of backroom capacity, but, but, we've talked about, if which undermines the ability of places... But, to Rachel, if I just want Local to government collapses, this country becomes virtually ungovernable. I, I, I just, Rachel, coming to you, just looking ahead to tomorrow, and tomorrow ITV are running the interview uh, with Rishi Sunak that they recorded uh, when he yeah. went back early... Uh, from D-Day to do it. He went back uh, to do that interview. I just want to ask you something. I know you're not that keen to talk about your brothers. However, mm -hmm. would Boris have left the D-Day commemorations early? That's a question for him. I Would you have? Would you have? Would any Boris, I, would any family? I would members? imagine n not in a million no. years because I think he understands the importance of the moment mm. that day to, to the morale and the and the yeah. and the emotion of this country, it's almost it is the the most important day in the, in the war. And the idea that you would then abandon it to do an interview with ITV that was not even playing for three days yeah. is simply inexplicable. Yeah. And nobody has yet explained it. No, I'm, nobody has explained it as no. to what actually happened. What do you think could possibly have happened that he just took direction from his officials? No, what no. was going on? I've worked for Boris. I can pretty categorically say he would not have left. He would have understood what it meant for people. I was one of the first people to say the Prime Minister probably definitely should should have stuck around. The one thing I will say in his defence, he was prepared to apologise. And I, think I mean, it, it, we, we could do nothing else for sure. Uh, correct. I, I agree with you. But it's interesting that... In this day and age, you'll have a politician who'll apologise. I think the public often appreciate that because apologies are hard to find in politics. But the bottom line is, it, it, it's something that he'll have to build back from. There's no doubt that people didn't like that he wasn't there. He's taken it on the chin and he's trying to move it forward. You'd have stayed, would you? Yeah, I mean, I know, I've been a candidate as well. You've been a candidate. A little bit of grace on my part to yeah. receive. In, you've got so much stuff going around in your head in the moment. And I don't know what's going on for his team, obviously. But first thing that popped into my head was where's his advisors, right? Yeah. Often, as a candidate, you, you know, you get rolled out, speak here, you get back in your box, and you roll out to the right. next event. That's but well, the, the, the point back is he chooses the people he puts around him. Yeah. Well, let's see if he says anything about it together. in tomorrow's yeah. ITV. He can't cut on about it, just he making can't. it well, He's turning yeah. D-Day into Dunkirk. And what, it, it's too live. He, when he was there and he shouldn't have been there, we have the benefit of hindsight. He doesn't have that at the time. Yeah. Thank you all very much for joining us yeah. tonight. Nick, too. Well, that's it for tonight. Victoria's here tomorrow. Till then, sleep well. Good night.